Welcome to chapter number seven, which is sixth move sidelines that white might throw at you. So at the sixth move, after we play g6, we've covered already. If you've followed the series, you already know how to deal with 95% of what you're going to see. The classical, both Yugoslav attacks, f4, maybe they might throw, maybe the fianchetto, all of these stuff, you know. The only thing you don't know is some random moves that you might see, something like bishop to b5 check that we'll look at. There's also bishop c4, which is by far the emphasis of this video because it's the most um, common, aside from the main moves that we looked at among the sidelines, this is the most common move, which is also very logical, just trying to get the bishop to a better square than the classical, but still trying to castle short. And then we'll also look at the move bishop g5, which is definitely a possibility, and it's absolutely a theoretical move you might see. Let's begin with the simplest, which is giving this check. Now, this is a check that exists in many different uh, Sicilians, not only the dragon. The move that I recommend, keep it simple, let's just trade the bishops off. Anyways, this is a very powerful bishop in many lines, so if we trade it off, that definitely cannot be bad for us. Then we take with the knight, and after bishop g7, it's clear that Black has absolutely equalized. I mean, we castle next, the rook comes to c8, the queen comes out to this square that you've seen a hundred times now on a5, and we have this very powerful bishop. The knight can move, we attack the center. This is uh, not scary at all. Also, this knight, although it looks passive, both of these squares are potential um, future squares for it, and from there, even c4 is an option for you to go to. So, this check not scary whatsoever. Let's also talk about bishop g5, which is another one that I can kind of um, answer pretty quickly, and then the rest of the video will focus on this main move, bishop to c4. So bishop g5 here, we continue by just developing very naturally. The idea is sometimes to take and wreck our pawn structure, but we don't give them that opportunity, and we develop quickly and defend with the bishop. Now here, if they throw in both bishop moves, <laughs> just trying to develop the bishops as actively as possible, this doesn't change much. I mean, we develop our bishop, we trade off pieces. I mean, this is very similar to the line we just looked at, only in, instead of moving the bishop to e3, they're moving it uh, to g5, and this is not scary whatsoever. The bishop is maybe even better um, somewhere else where it's defending the center. So that's not really uh, something to be scared of. Bishop c4 is the more important continuation. Again, this is the best square for this bishop. Here we continue by castles. They castle, we go knight c6, let's say they take and take, and now rook b1, trying to uh, get rid of some of the pressure on this diagonal. We continue with rook t8, and after rook t1, I mean, we're just getting our pieces involved, and here is a huge difference and benefit of the bishop being on g5. It's more susceptible to moves like queen a5, which now come with tempo. And if the bishop wants to stay on this diagonal, aka go to h4 here, then, I mean, this is totally fine for us. We simply go knight to d7. Our knight will come to e5. The bishop can develop in a variety of ways. The rook finds very nice uh, shelter on, on b8, and this bishop has been opened up. So h4 doesn't make a lot of sense. They can move, I mean, again, anywhere else here, but none of this is scary. They just wasted time by moving the bishop first here, and then here. They should have just gone here immediately, so we're just playing all of these other lines that you've seen from all of these other chapters. We're just playing it with an extra tempo, uh, which, of course, is a huge bonus. For instance, here, a natural move I would maybe think of is going knight g4 and then rerouting the knight to e5, as we saw in some other chapters. So again, you want to be making these connections so you can play the dragon as a full whole, uh, whole opening and understand it fully instead of having to memorize moves. You kind of see these common patterns and commonalities between these variations. So that leaves us with the special bishop to c4, which um, I'm sure you're going to see a lot. Um, especially at the lower levels, this maybe is the move that is most important for you because maybe you'll see this the most. Now, we continue with bishop g7 uh, as we normally do, and here let's say they go bishop e3. They can also castle, but let's start with bishop e3. 
Weaken castle, they go f3. We go knight c6, queen d2, and well, guess what? We transposed 100% into the Yugoslav attack that I talked about in the uh, second or third chapter with bishop to c4, where, I mean, if you recall, uh, just to, to quiz you, we go for this bishop e6 line, and here they have two options. We covered this fully in depth in an earlier chapter, so obviously I'm not going to repeat what I said then. That's definitely an opportunity uh, that can arise when they put their bishop on c4, which they do, um, of course, also in the Yugoslav attack with nine bishop c4, which was actually chapter three. So um, instead of bishop e3, they can castle. This is the, the more classical way to play this because they want to develop and then castle instead of going into this mainline theory. So we castle, and here they have three moves, none of which really pose much problems. Bishop e3, we go knight g4, and uh, really happy here. The knight's either going to take the bishop, stay here really powerfully, or eventually go to e5 and later maybe to c4, maybe taking this bishop. Really good stuff. They can alternatively go rook e1, after which we develop knight c6. They go h3, we take the knight, and now drop back. We want to open up our bishop in many of these lines, as you see, by going the knight either to g4 or to d7, that's something that we often want to do to open up the bishop, give it full potential, and now this is a really powerful position. I mean, the rook comes to c8, the rook comes to e8 in these cases, because f5 is less of an option and a move when the bishop is so powerful on this diagonal, because it's hard to touch the bishop, and the queen, of course, the square we all know and love, a5. So, Nothing to worry about in this variation. And the final option that they have instead of rookie one is to go bishop to d2, just developing more passively. And I actually included this just to show you a nice tactical idea um, among the many tactical ideas. I know this is kind of getting into the next chapter where we're going to be talking about common tactical motifs, but just to preview that, if they go bishop d2 here, we take, win back the material, um, although maybe even d5. In fact, the engine seems to prefer d5 here, um, or maybe now it's like likes taking here, but the point is we're going to win back the material, the bishop is strong, and d5 is on the horizon, and so really nice uh, stuff. So, I mean, if they don't go for these mainline stuff, it's something that we can really easily combat and defuse. Again, here we go for this trade, and we're really happy taking away their, their strong bishop, here, we just develop normally, and the bishop is misplaced here because we attack it with queen a5, and this critical bishop c4, something you might see a lot, we just develop, we kind of ignore it. If they transpose into the Yugoslav, perfect, we know that really well, and if they don't, that's also fine. We're just developing normally, um, not doing anything too special. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Stay tuned. Uh, we're already almost finished with this masterclass. Two more chapters left. So hopefully you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new around here. Like this video if you enjoyed it, and I will see you next time. Peace out.